weeks. This month's guest speaker is <coughs> Professor, Distinguished Professor Brian Boyd from the English Department at the Auckland University. And his talk, as you can see, is on evolution, fiction and religion. And I'd like you to all to extend a very warm welcome to him. Thank you. Thank you. On this, our Lord's Day, let us commence with a lesson from Holy Scripture. The text for today comes from Genesis 9, verses 13 to 15. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a, of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Here endeth the lesson. Within Jewish, Christian and Muslim traditions, God gave the, the rainbow as a, a covenant that he would never again subject the world to the deluge that drowned all but Noah and those on his ark. Promises, promises. Other traditions have their own rainbow stories from the Australian Aboriginal rainbow serpent, a kind of creator god, to the Scandinavian rainbow bridge from earth to heaven. No wonder, because a rainbow is such a wonder. It catches the eye, but eludes the grasp of human hand and mind. Its association with rain and sun could have told our ancestors a different kind of story. But the physics of light and the geometry of refraction and reflection, linking sun, rain and observer, eluded explanation until science established itself firmly in, the, in 17th century Europe, and Newton donned his thinking cap. Spectral can mean of a spectrum or of a spectre. Why have humans from time immemorial found stories about spectres not just easier to imagine and understand but hard to resist, and stories about spectra and the like so hard to fathom or stomach? Why have humans so often explained the world through stories of supernatural agents rather than in terms of science? For longer than I care to think about, I've been trying to work out an evolutionary account of fiction. Part of that project means asking whether storytelling is a human adaptation, whether it could have been selected for as a behaviour by evolution. To answer that, you need to consider the biological function of storytelling. What difference, if any, would storytelling have made in terms of survival and reproduction in the conditions in which this behaviour became established, if it has become biologically established? To answer that, you need to consider the impact on survival and reproduction, not just of stories that are taken as fictions, but also of invented stories that are taken as true, of religion. Let me just get this next bit off my chest. I won't be able to settle into the rest of the argument unless I tell you this. I'll talk about what you m most want to hear if you'll listen to what I most want to say. Is that a bargain? I see art as a human adaptation that derives from play, a behaviour widespread across animal classes and perhaps universal in mammals. Play evolved through the advantages of flexibility. The amount of play in a species correlates with the flexibility of its action repertoire. <coughs> Behaviours like escape and pursuit, attack and defence and social give and take can make life or death differences. Creatures with more motivation to practice and extend such behaviours in situations of low urgency can fare better at moments of high urgency. Animals that play repeatedly and exuberantly hone skills, widen repertoires and sharpen sensitivities. Play has therefore evolved to be highly self-rewarding. Because it's compulsive, animals engage in it again and again, incrementally altering muscle tone and neural wiring, strengthening and speeding up synaptic pathways, improving their capacity and performance. Humans uniquely inhabit what's been called the cognitive niche. We gain most of our advantages from intelligence. I should say that I'll be using this, this we again and again. We meaning humans, including our ancestors, not humanists. We perhaps meaning 
irrationalists rather than rationalists. So to backtrack, we gain most of our advantages from intelligence. We therefore have an appetite for information and especially for pattern, information that falls into meaningful arrays from which we can make rich inferences. Information can be costly to obtain and analyse, but because it offers an invaluable basis for action, nature evolves senses and minds to gather and process information appropriate to particular modes of life. From sonar in bats or electroception in fish to the exquisite sense of touch of the star-nosed mole. Not the prettiest of animals, but... Like other species, humans can assimilate information through the rapid processing that specialised pattern recognition allows. But unlike other species, we also seek, shape and share information in an open-ended way. Since pattern makes complex data swiftly intelligible... I hope you can see what that is. It's a Dalmatian in dappled light. Since pattern makes complex data relatively swiftly intelligible, we actively pursue patterns, especially those that yield the richest inferences to our minds in our most valuable information systems, the senses of light and sound, and our most crucial domain, social information. We can define art as cognitive play with pattern. Just as play refines behavioural options over time by being self-rewarding, so art increases cognitive skills, repertoires and sensitivities. Like play, art succeeds by engaging and rewarding attention, since the more frequent and intense our involvement, the more powerful the neural consequences. Art's appeal to our preferences for pattern means that we expose ourselves to high concentrations of humanly appropriate information keenly enough so that over time we strengthen the neural, <coughs> the neural pathways that process key patterns in open-ended ways. Now to one particular art, the art of fiction. We've evolved to tell stories because the most powerful, high-level processing, processing that nature has built into human minds is in terms of understanding other agents, especially human agents. We now have other still more powerful ways of processing information, and you can fill in the blank here with uh, whatever your favourite subject happens to be, but they are culturally learned and therefore difficult to acquire, rather than naturally designed and therefore naturally emerging in childhood, like language, without formal instruction. Most researchers on the evolution of mind agree that the main impetus for the emergence of high intelligence has been social complexity. For individualised and highly social species like dolphins, chimpanzees or humans, the social world fluctuates more, far more subtly and swiftly than the rest of the biological world. A chimpanzee will have much the same reaction to any colobus monkey or any leopard but its reaction to another chimpanzee varies according to the other's size, sex, age, personality, status, alliances and situation. Relating to other conspecifics places heavy demands on mental computation. In our own case, we've evolved a new degree of understanding one another, what biologists and psychologists call theory of mind. Other animals have elements of theory of mind, they can understand others in terms of desires and intentions. But only humans understand others, not only in terms of desires and intentions, but in terms of belief, in terms of what they think they know. 